<laughs> Welcome to Grace Vineyard Church. We are so excited to have you joining us today. My name is Jess. My name is Tino. And Tino is actually one of our new youth and worship interns. So Tino, why don't you tell us what's been going on in the youth world at Grace? Oh man, it's been so good. The Holy Spirit's been moving heavily, which has been awesome. We've had three salvations at City Campus, which so is sick. so good. So praise Nothing Jesus. Nothing to do with us, but Come on. let's go. Praise Jesus. And man, we've been so excited about like from the last couple of years, just seeing the Holy Spirit move year by year. And like now we're just building up that more excitement for the youth in the future. So 2022. Good. 2022. Let's go. Awesome. On that note, why don't we pray and we'll head into some worship. Absolutely. Yeah, dear Lord, we thank you so much that you're moving. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're ministering to us. And Lord, right now, I pray for those that are watching us, those on the other side of the screen. Lord, would you bless them? Lord, would you fill their room with the Holy Spirit? And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship.
and welcome to Grace at Your Place. It is so good to have you tuned in today. We have no church at the moment uh, in our own church, but we are meeting together in homes and lovely to have you tuning in online and also on Shine TV. My goodness, the pandemic has really taken off and we're just praying that people keep safe and well. And of course, across the world, uh, bizarre things happening, horrible things happening. In Ukraine, of course, the invasion by the Russians there. And we just need to be just praying that God God comes and moves uh, across the world at this time. Uh, We've been getting some lovely letters in and also meeting lovely people. Last week, we met Dick and Jeanette Searle and Rangiora who tune in. And so wherever you are viewing from, we wanna welcome you today. We're doing a series which is based on our mission statement to be disciples and to make disciples. And we're focused on the first part of that, what it means to be a disciple. This week, my topic is planted. And I wanna talk about the fact that a true disciple of Jesus, the real person who follows Jesus is a person who was planted in the house of the Lord. And we get this from Psalm 92 verses 12 to 14, where it says, "'The righteous will flourish like palm trees. "'They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. "'Planted in the house of the Lord, "'they will flourish in the courts of our God.'" They will still be a fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Now, this is a wonderful uh, verse where it talks about the fact that the righteous people, that is people who are right with God, will flourish and grow because they are planted in the house of the Lord. And we'll come back to that in a few moments. And it says that they will flourish in the courts of our God. And I love this part in verse 14. It says, they will still bear fruit in old age and they will stay fresh and green. In other words, living their best lives, staying healthy and still bearing fruit in their spiritual lives because they dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, the house of the Lord in the Old Testament, uh, where this is written in the Psalms, is referring, of course, to the temple. And imagine that this tree uh, that it's talking about is actually planted there in the temple grounds in the house of the Lord and the courts of the Lord. And because it's planted there, it has protection and it flourishes, it stays green and it produces fruit. Now, of course, uh, in Psalm 92 here, it's not just talking about physically being planted in the area of the temple. It's talking about the spiritual house of God. When people are planted in God's spiritual house, they will flourish. And in the New Testament, the spiritual house of God is the church. God has designed a place where Christians are, the followers of Jesus come together, they grow together, they flourish together. In fact, uh, there are multiple references in the New Testament that refer to the church as the house of God. In a number of places, it uses the Greek word oikos, which means a house, a home, a family or a household. And it's talking about the fact that when people are planted in the house of God, in the church, that is where they're gonna flourish. 
And the reason that I want to talk about this today is because I'm really concerned at the state of the church in our own country and also in the Western world and a lot of deception that people get into. And I think often it's because people actually drift away from the teachings of Jesus. It is so important, as the Scripture says, to be planted. And that word planted means something permanent. It's something stationary. It's something that will not move. And Psalm 92 is referring to two types of very massive trees, a palm tree, you know how big that is, that's pretty huge, and a cedar tree, which is actually even bigger. And those two types of trees are not trees that you easily move and they're not designed to be just moved around at will. So it's talking about uh, when a Christian person, a person of faith is planted, they're supposed to be there to stay and that's going to be where they flourish. Now, when I was a young boy, we lived in the little North Canterbury town of Rangiora. And every Christmas, we had a lovely old man called Colin Campbell. He was well known in the town, who used to come and bring us a little Christmas tree, a little pine tree in a pot. I think Colin worked for the local forestry and uh, I think several people were delivered by him these little uh, Christmas trees, these little uh, uh, pine trees. And so they weren't very big, they were quite small, they came in a pot and usually when we'd finished them, we would throw them out or they would just die. But I remember once we got this little Christmas tree when it had, had done its work, it had uh, been in our home, it's been, it had been decorated up. I think we put it out. In fact, I think one of us actually planted it in the ground when we thought it was dead. And the next thing it came to life. And because it wasn't confined to the little pot, it grew really high and it grew really big and it grew very fast as pine trees do. In fact, it grew so big that in the end we had to chop it down because it was blocking out all the sunshine and we hadn't realised that it would grow so fast and so big. But the key was the fact that as soon as it came out of the pot, it flourished. It's Uh, Roots went down far and they went out wide and it just gave life to this pine tree and up up it moved. While it was in the pot, it could be moved around. It could be taken from place to place, but also it didn't grow and it didn't ever flourish. It didn't reach its potential. And you know, the same thing applies spiritually. Some people can be like pot plants. They go from church to church, from conference to conference, and they never actually get planted. They never stay in one place. And what they don't realise, and this is what the Scripture is talking about, that when we aren't planted, our spiritual roots don't don't grow down deep, deep, and we never reach the destiny. We never reach the, the flourishing that God intends for us to be. And sadly, over my years as a pastor, I've noticed that people who don't get planted in a church or don't get planted in a group of people have the most problems in their lives. Their kids are more likely to to fall away. Their marriages are more likely to break up and they are the most inclined to fall into deception. In general, they just do not spiritually flourish because they are like pot plants that only have a short life and and do not reach the potential that they possibly could have. Uh, We've been reading a wonderful book by a man called Rich Velotis and uh, he has written a great book called The Deeply Formed Life. And in the introduction, he talks about redwood trees, these magnificent trees you see in America that can grow up to 400 feet high, which is 121 metres, like the equivalent to a 37-storey building. And these redwoods are so strong because their roots are robustly intertwined with each other. They don't have really deep roots of their own. What happens is when you plant a whole lot of redwoods together, the root systems intertwine with each other and make them strong so that they can grow up high. Rich Velotis says the roots often go only five or six feet deep, but they extend outward up to 100 feet from the trunk. That's about 30 metres. Each tree is deeply sustained by the larger, wider system of roots that provides stability, enabling them to grow high in the sky. What a wonderful metaphor here for the Christian church. 
that uh, the tree grows high and tall and is protected and reaches its potential because its roots are intertwined with the roots of other trees. And friends, this is the way that God has designed Christians today. He has not designed us to be a strong tree by ourselves. He has designed us to only be strong when we are dependent on other people. Now, there's a lot of stuff going around today about freedom and independence and all those types of things. But I wanna tell you, God has not designed Christians to be independent. In fact, He has designed us to be interdependent or dependent on other people. We are not designed to be uh, disciples by ourselves. He has created us to be part of a team. It's just like if you have a his and hers set of towels, the his one is incomplete without the other one. It's like a rugby team. You don't just have the fullback. You need to have the whole rest of the team. A fullback is designed to be part of the team. It's like an orchestra. You know, the triangle is not designed to just be by itself. It's designed to be part of a much wider group of instruments that all play together. And you know what? God has made us so that we are incomplete without other Christians. And the group of Christians that He has designed us to be part of is called the church. It's that Greek word ecclesia, which actually means a team. It actually means a group of people who are called out for a, for a separate task. He has not designed the church to be independent people or individual people. You know, I hear a lot of people these days, I think, who are stuck in the Old Testament. They don't realise that there's a whole set of books after Malachi. And in the Old Testament, sometimes people base themselves on the Old Testament prophets, where God would sometimes be so um, upset with the whole nation that He would just call out an individual and speak through an individual prophet. But I want you to know God doesn't work like that in the New Testament. The prophets, the prophetic people actually work as teams. And all of the church is to be designed to work together as a team, not just with a whole bunch of people who are individuals. So it worries me that there are people around today who are operating the way they see the Old Testament to be and are not operating in a New Testament structure. And that is unfortunately deception. You know, the Old uh, Testament prophetic uh, model was, it's just me and God. I hear from God all by myself and I just do what God tells me to do. But friends, that is an Old Testament model and it was an Old Testament model for a very uh, uh, a very uh, intricate set of circumstances. We don't actually have that situation now. Today, prophetic people operate within the bounds of authority and uh, with the rest of the church as well. And so we're living in the New Testament. We're not living in the Old Testament. And it is very much deception to be operating as a pot plant. In the New Testament, we are very much designed to be working as a team. And you know, the Bible uh, uses the analogy of Christians working together like a human body. And the Apostle Paul teaches on this at length because obviously there were people there that were trying to be independent and do their own thing. And uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 12, the body is a unit. Though it's made up of many parts and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. In other words, he's saying uh, Jesus operates in the world today just the way a body works. Yes, there are a whole lot of different parts to the body, but they operate as one unit. They are all intricately designed to work together. And then in verses 18 to 20, it says, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. In other words, He's saying that every single person comes together, they work together, they are part of a team. And as they work as a team, that is the way God works in the world today. Verses 25 to 27, it says, So that there should be no division in the body, uh, but the parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each of you is a part of it. 
So he's talking about the fact that uh, different parts of the body can't go off and do their own thing. We can't have division. We can't have the fingers walking off to do their own thing or the toes walking off to do their own thing. We have to be together. We have to work together. We are all part of each other. And even though we're different and we have different tasks, we belong together. And together we are powerful. We are strong, but divided, we are useless. Paul points this out in verse 21 where he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. And yet using this analogy, we see that people do actually feel that they can operate by themselves. And I often think, I call it fingernail theology, where a little fingernail might detach from the the finger and think I can actually be useful all by myself. I don't need to have a finger to be attached to. I don't need a hand to be attached to. I don't need to be attached to the body. I can be a little powerful fingernail all by myself. Now we all know that a fingernail by itself is utterly useless. It's not good for anything, but when it is joined to the finger, joined to the hand, a fingernail is a vital thing that we all use all the time. So you can see that we can come into incredible deception pulling away from the body of Christ and feeling that we can do things in an independent way. And I wanna tell you today that independence is a mark of Satan. Satan has always been trying to divide. He always tries to pull people away from church. He pulls people away from the group. He pulls people away from the team. And this is what Paul's been talking about. He's saying, come together, work together, be part of a team. Don't fall into the enemy's trap of being divided. And independence is a mark of Satan. You'll notice that in the Garden of Eden, there was the snake there, that was Satan. And he was trying to divide Adam and Eve off from God. He was saying, don't do what God wants you to do. Don't be joined together with Him. You think for yourself. You be independent. You do the things that you want to do. And friends, that spirit is still alive today. That, that spirit was, that was in, in the Garden of Eden is alive today, encouraging us, trying to get us to come away from the purposes of God. But you know, God has designed the church as a place where disciples can thrive. In fact, God has designed a whole system by which that we can grow and thrive as disciples. And so if we continue on from the, uh, those verses we were reading, if we go to verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each of you has a part in it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those with gifts of healing, those who are able to help others and those with gifts of administration and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. See, God has designed His church to have order. There's a system that's there so that people can thrive. There are leaders like apostles and prophets and teachers who can bring order and bring direction and say, this is what's the, what the Lord is saying. This is the direction we should go. And people who will train up others. And then there are people who have gifts of healing and miracles. And then the very important people, the administrators, people who create systems and people who create order. And then a whole lot of people who have other spiritual gifts as well, all working together. And I know in our own church and in our own movement, we value all these different gifts, the people who have leadership gifts and the people who have teaching gifts and the people who have training gifts, the people who have pastoring gifts, those who are administrative and those who are artistic. We can't do without any of them. We need them, but we need to be able to work together. And that's how God brings strength to His church. He's designed all of us to have different gifts, but we work together in unity. Now, friends, I hear a lot of people talking today with great glee about how they don't belong to a church or they belong to a group that has no order. I heard somebody say the other day, we belong to a group and there's, there's no leaders and there's no systems and, and things. And I think, oh my goodness, you're, you're not part of a biblical church. These things aren't bad. These are things that God has designed. 
And just as you see the armies working overseas in this horrific time at the moment, a good army is one that has systems and it has people who lead and it has people who are strategic and people that can work together. You can't have an army where people are just going off in all directions and doing the things that they want to do. So when people gleefully talk about a group of people that has no systems and no leadership and and no form of giving and no form of mission, I'm thinking to myself, the enemy has won. The enemy has deceived people into thinking that chaos is the way the, the, the church ought to be. But friends, God is a God of order and God has designed His church to have leaders and systems and order. And He's designed it so there are always people being trained and sent out and there is fruit. You know, one of the sad things about today is the fact that people do not like accountability and people do not like to submit. They do not like to be under the authority of other people. And friends, this is the spirit of rebellion that comes into people's hearts and it very much is a, is a spirit of the age. You know, uh, to many of us, the word submission and, and obey and, and uh, accountability are dirty words. And the reason for that is there is a spirit of rebellion that comes from the enemy. He wants us to rebel from God. He wants us to rebel from people that God has set up to be leaders. And uh, we can see in Hebrews 13, verse 17, it says this, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, friends, God has set up systems. God uh, appoints people to lead in every area of life. And God says, obey those leaders unless what they're telling you to do is against the Scripture or it is totally against God. Otherwise, God says that we should obey and we should submit. And you know, rather than fighting submission, because to many of us, submission is a dirty word, submission is something that comes right throughout the Scripture. Submission talks about humility. It's a person's heart that is actually saying, I will bow, I will listen, I will uh, will honour another person. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in submission to the Father. Jesus came in and even though He didn't need to, He submitted Himself to some of the authorities that were around at the time, unless He was being told to do something that was completely wrong. So, you know, rather than pushing away from submission and obedience, we should look for people to submit to. You know, at any time uh, in our world, there are all these people that God has called us to, to submit to. In my own role, I'm submitted to groups of people in our own church. And then there's a board that's above me and there's an international group of directors that are above me as well. But as I move around the city, I'm, I'm to submit to the police and I'm to submit to the, the uh, city council. I'm to submit to the government. There are groups of people that God has placed in authority. Now, it's true that if they ask us to do something that is against Scripture or something that is wrong, uh, God would not say to obey something that is biblically wrong. But if it's not biblically wrong, I am called to be a person that submits. That should be a thing that I do with joy to submit to others. But friends, there is a spirit in the world today that is rebellion. And it's very easy for us as Christians to buy into that. And it's a spirit that's very uh, easily to open ourselves up to. All we need to do is to buy into some of the offence that is around and rebellion can come into our hearts. Now in 1 Samuel 15 verse 23, it says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. When we sin, we are, when we are rebellious, we are opening our, ourselves up to a spirit of witchcraft which deceives us into being rebellious. The spirit of witchcraft is definitely operating in the church today where people try to undermine legitimate leadership. They undermine the work of God. And it's easier to come under that if we become offended. You know, it saddens me because I see around the world today and even in our own country, so much deception. And I think a lot of this comes from a lack of Bible knowledge. It comes from a a lack of accountability. 
And there are a lot of people that are running around saying that they are operating under God and and I don't see uh, anything within them that is of God at all. You know, people are coming to me and saying that they have prophetic words or sending me prophetic words. And I always ask them this question first. I say, what church do you belong to? Or who are you accountable to? And most of the time, a lot of the people that are sending me these things that don't belong to any church, they have no form of accountability. They have nobody above them. They are just speaking their own stuff. And friends, uh, I know instantly that these people are in deception because this is not a New Testament model. The Bible says uh, in in, uh, the New Testament in 1 Corinthians, you see, God has actually built in safeguards to make sure that we don't get into deception. So in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 29, it says, two or three prophets should speak and others should weigh carefully what is said. See, nobody today speaks the Word of the Lord infallibly every time. The Bible says in the New Testament that a person needs to bring a word and others should sit around and weigh it up. Or one of the other translations says to judge it. In other words, they need to pray and say, Lord, is this person getting it right? And this is one of the uh, safety mechanisms that the New Testament has. Uh, In 1 John 4 verse 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So it says that there are people that are going out into the world, they're going out into the church and they're bringing prophetic words or they're bringing words that they say are from God. And the Bible says here, you need to test the spirit. You need to say, God, is this your spirit which is operating or or is this a demonic spirit that that is operating through these people? You need to test that. And I wanna tell you, there's a lot of demonic spirits that are operating today and wise people need to come together and they need to test the words and they need to weigh them up. 1 Corinthians 14 verse three says, everyone who prophesies to men for their, speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement and comfort. And so that should be the thing that determines New Testament prophecy. Does it strengthen? Does it encourage? And does it bring comfort? And I'll tell you some of the words that I've heard recently have no hope in them whatsoever. They're condemning. They're, they're bringing down you know, fire and brimstone onto people. They have no future and, and they are discouraging. And, and uh, you can tell as soon as you hear them, this does not come from the Spirit of the Lord. And this is one of the dangers of people who are operating outside accountability systems and outside church structures. They are bringing things uh, which really doesn't come from the heart of God at all. So some of the reasons that people become offended, the the reason people become pot plants, one of them, as I've mentioned, is the spirit of offence. We become offended and instead of dealing with it the way the New Testament tells us to, we just go out, out on our own. And we think, I don't need the church. I don't need other people. I don't need accountability. It's just gonna be me and God. And friends, that is deception. Another one is a spirit of unforgiveness where once again, we don't deal with issues. We may fall out with somebody or somebody hurts us. And so instead of doing what the New Testament says of coming and meeting with people and trying to get forgiveness and trying to iron things out, we let bitterness take over our hearts and that opens us up to a spirit of deception. Another thing is rebellion. Or as the Scripture says, witchcraft. Rebellion is where we think, you know what? I'm not gonna do what other people tell me to do. I'm not gonna be under other people's rules. I'm gonna do what I think is best. You know, in the Old Testament, it says that that people who went away from God were people that did things that they thought was right in their own eyes. And friends, that is rebellion, it is witchcraft. When people don't get their own way, when they uh, don't wanna be under any form of accountability, when they wanna take charge of themselves, they break away and become pot plants. Another group of people that become independent are people who just come under wrong teaching. And there's a lot of rubbishy teaching out there at the moment. And when you get uh, rubbishy teaching, you produce rubbish in your life spiritually. And you don't get discipled properly and you don't relate to to the church of Jesus. 
Another one I come across is the spirit of pride. And I come across this a lot where people come up and, and the implication they give, and you see this on social media as well, is I have a superior relationship with God to what you've got or what anyone else has got. I have a deeper revelation of what God's saying. I know what's going on in the world, but you don't. God has hidden that from you and He's revealed it to just me. And friends, this is a terrible spirit of, of pride. It's a religious spirit, which is very much what the Pharisees had in the early New Testament. And then friends, people leave, people become independent just because of sin. They either become so rich and wealthy that they feel they don't need God, or they become so entrenched in sin, sexual sin and, and just the ways of the world uh, and they get so deceived that they feel that they don't need to walk with Jesus. They may call themselves Christians, they may have a Bible, they may go through one or two uh, religious procedures but they do not walk with Jesus because sin has taken them away and they become independent. And friends, we've got to pray for people like this. You know, the Bible says you will know them by their fruit, whatever they produce out of their lives. And so I, I wanna draw to a close by saying it is important to get planted because when you're planted in the house of the Lord, you are safe. You are in an environment where you're gonna grow and prosper. And one of the things I always say is that when you are in a church, when, you, when you're in a good church, you will have accountability, if you come up with wacky ideas, there'll be multiple people that will come and try to put you on the, on the right path. I mean, in the job that I've got, I've got people that send me letters all the time saying, that thing you said was wrong or I disagreed with the way you said that or are you sure that Scripture is right the way you interpreted that? And so what's happening is it's being challenged all the time, which is actually a good thing. It's good to be in an environment where people can challenge and where they can bring correction and love. And that's what a local church does. And a local church is where God has designed you to thrive. Now, I know at the moment it's very hard to join a local church uh, because of a lot of people being locked down. But I wanna encourage you, if you can get alongside a group of people where there are leaders and where there's accountability and where you have a chance to grow, where you can share your giftings and where you can receive blessing from others, you can even do that online at the moment. But when the lockdowns are over and, and uh, when we get back to our normal services, it is so important to go somewhere where you can get planted. Will you have problems in the church? Of course you will. Will there be offence uh, in there? Of course. Will people uh, annoy you? Of course they will. Because the church is full of human beings. We often joke, wouldn't it be wonderful if there were no human beings in the church, we would have no more problems. But friends, what a great thing if we come to a place where we say, the devil will not take me away. He will not cause me to become independent from his people, from his team, from his church, because that's the strategy that he has. And not only will you thrive in a church, but also you'll be able to help other people to thrive as well. Hebrews 10 verse 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some, as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, let's hold on to our faith. Let's keep committed, keep committed to our friends. Let's not all become independent and give up meeting together, but instead let's encourage each other. When times get tough, let's not pull away, but let's pull closer and encourage each other. It's saying, hold on to your faith, hold on to each other, don't stop meeting together and let's just keep encouraging each other. You know, God has designed a place for Christians to meet and that is called the church, the house of the Lord. And I wanna read that, those verses again, just as we close uh, that I read at the beginning from Psalm 92. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age and they will stay fresh and green. You know, we uh, had a funeral for my dad last year. He lived to a hundred years of age and we read those verses out. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age and they will stay fresh and green. 
And although my dad was a hundred when he passed away, he was very vibrant in his faith. And from an early time as a young man, he'd been part of the church. He'd been a minister for 70 years in the Presbyterian church. And he was very vibrant in his faith in every way. In fact, uh, my mum and dad, uh, they moved to a retirement village in Pukekohe a couple of years ago. And when they went there, they joined about three different churches. They couldn't get enough of church. And uh, they would go to a couple in the morning and they'd go to one at night. And uh, in the middle, between the morning and the evening, they would be watching Shine TV and all the different services there as well because they just loved the church. And when my dad passed away, sadly, the lockdowns came and one of the things my mum has found the hardest has not been to get has not been able to get along to church because that's where she has been planted from a young age and it's a testimony to them that I see that they have flourished in their spiritual lives that they even in old age have been fresh and green and still producing fruit and I love the fact that some of the churches they've gone to have been sort of wild with uh, loud music and lots of young people around. And I said to them once, you know, is this, is this the type of church for people your age? And they said, we just love being around young people. And that's the thing, when you're in the house of God, you stay young in spirit and you are there to encourage other people who are around. And what an important thing to be part of the church at a time when the world is in chaos. Because friends, what the world needs is the local church, which is the hope of the world. And instead of pulling away and doing our thing more so than ever, we need to be planted in churches. We need to strengthen our churches. We need to gather together as the church and do the things that God wants because when we're in unity, that's when the Lord commands a blessing. When we're in unity, that's where God is present and our prayers are the most powerful. And you know, God hasn't departed from His church. He hasn't walked away. He says in Matthew 16, verse 18, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. You know, Jesus believes in His church. Jesus knows that the way to defeat Satan, the way to defeat wars, the way to defeat pandemics is by having a strong and vibrant praying church working together as a team. People may ask, where is God in all the mess in the world? And I'll tell you, He is in the local church. He is amongst His people. He is with His body. There's Jesus and the bride, His church working together to be a powerful witness to the things that God is doing. So I wanna encourage you as a disciple of Jesus, make sure you are planted with His church, planted in the house of the Lord, flourishing in the courts of God. And so that you not only will flourish, but you'll help others to flourish and you will bear fruit for the kingdom as well. Well, it's been great being with you again today and I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray, especially if you've been hurt in a church or you've become disenfranchised with church or fallen away. I'd love to pray that God would heal your heart and that you would have the courage to be a New Testament Christian where you can put things right with people and that you can go along church. I wanna tell you, my parents, uh, you know, have been in church all my life, you know, uh, uh, decades and decades and they've been hurt and they've had horrible things said to them. And, and I've had exactly the same thing as a pastor. You should see some of the letters I've received recently uh, in these strange times. But you know, these are all things to discourage us and to pull us away. And what we've got to do is hang on and not let the devil win. So I wanna pray for you if you've been discouraged and pray that you would find a good church. So let's pray. Father, I pray for all those who are watching today. I pray that all of us will have a fresh commitment to your church, not only so that we would flourish, but so others would flourish and so that your church would flourish and that together we could be the mighty team that Jesus has designed so that we would defeat the enemy of this world, that we would rise up together with incredible unity and release the the presence and the power of God in this time. And Lord, I pray that if there are those who don't know you who are watching today, that in their hearts they would open up to you and say, Jesus, please come and live in my heart. Make yourself real to me. Lord, we pray for Ukraine at this time and we pray that you would come with mighty power and protect those people there. 
We pray for people who are sick up and down our nation and around the world with COVID and other things. We pray that You'd bring healing, that You'd defend our country, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray that You would grow us in our faith. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Friends, if we can help you in any way, if you've made a decision to follow Jesus or you have any questions, please email us at info at grace.org.nz. Uh, we have a lot of different programs on our website at grace.org.nz. And uh, we just want you to know that we are praying for you at this time and we wish you well. God bless. Ka kite anō.